6.1. It says, God is our refuge and strength, very present help in trouble. Psalm 142.2 says, Blessed be the Lord, my strength, my goodness, my fortress, my high tower, and my deliverer, my shield, and he whom I trust. So it's not on our Facebook Live, but it's on Pondas. So I just so everybody get your phones out and message your friends and say, go to Pondas Facebook page and you can see it live. Uh, but uh, a couple of announcements for those. Remember, today's our egg hunt from two to five. It's going to be different. So uh, we will. We have a, a, a group. I think it's on the. Uh, uh, First United Methodist Church Children's page, uh, a map and a list. Samantha Hartzell's put together a list of those that are going to have eggs. We're asking you to go and be safe in that process, but parents, we're trying to give you something to do with your children. You'll take them to the stop. If somebody else is there, everybody stay in the car until the others have gotten their eggs and are back in the car. We're asking you to let them only get one egg to go and pick up their egg at the stop and then wave at the house as they walk back up to their car and, and get in the car to go to the next stop. Uh, so let's be safe there, but everybody is prepared and ready for you to come and make those. I think there's 16 stops, 
Samantha has it laid out so you won't have to backtrack. You can start on one end or the other. I think we're ill. I think we decided to start at number one and then what would that be? M through Z to start at number 16 so it's not everybody at the same spot at the same time and work your way back through there. Also remember on our website there is a posting of all the Holy Week services. I know things are different. Every day this week, Monday through Friday at 12 noon, there will be a Zoom time, a devotion and discussion time. Uh, that will be posted how to log into that Zoom meeting and be a part of that on those days. On Tuesday night, and since we will not have our normal service of the cross, what I'm asking everybody to do is at 6 o'clock that night, please stop for a few minutes. Pray for the Catholic Church, our brothers and sisters there. Pray for the CME Church, the, our brothers and sisters there. And, and lift them up in prayer, because that's what that service is about. Do that. On Monday, Thursday, we will have communion. It will be done in a drive-by fashion. There will be one group of men that will help direct traffic. Uh, you'll actually pull around and come in between the two buildings I'll be there. I'll be the only one there. There'll be a table set up. I'll put the uh, communion elements, which are the self-contained stuff, on a tray, hand that to you, the number that are in the car, and then we will have a prayer, and then you will pull out, and the next car will pull in. Four to six, four to six yes, from four until six. So please uh, remember that and be a part of that. Next Sunday morning, hopefully... We will be live on Facebook, and, and everything will run proper. But if you're up early at 6 a.m., uh, turn to our church's Facebook page, and you'll see a, a sunrise message that morning that will be offered at 6 a.m. Now, I think that's, is that all the announcements? Did I forget something? Oh, yeah. Our, uh, as all of you know, on May the 3rd, we had scheduled our 200-year celebration. Obviously, because of what's going on, we uh, decided that it would be best to reschedule that. We have moved it to November the 1st, so we will have the bicentennial celebration on November the 1st, but uh, we did not want... I'm praying that we'll be back in church together in May, but who knows? But at least if we are here, we'll have a different kind of celebration when we do all come back together. So please uh, make your plans now to rearrange your schedule and put November the 1st on your calendar for our 200-year celebration. Also, if you're one of our youth that, are, that have found us now and are watching live, if you will, uh, you said you were going to post it, what on? If you'll check your group me. There'll be a posting of how you can join in for Sunday school and a time of discussion this morning. I think Buddy must have, the way he looked, you just posted on group me or something. Oh, I thought you went high-fiving it on there. Yeah, so, uh, but uh, that will be out there as well. Let's uh, bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Several of you saw the text about Deborah Hester. Please be in prayer for her, but we do not think that that it is COVID, it, maybe it is something with her asthma was the text this morning. So that's good news, but continue to pray for her speedy recovery. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Our gracious and loving God, we are grateful for this day that you have blessed us with. For this time that we can gather together and worship you. And Lord, even though it is in a different setting and different ways, wherever we are, we know that you are there. So, Lord, we all lift up our voices and our hearts to you in this moment. And, Lord, we pray that you will reach out and touch us all, that you will fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit, and that you will help us each to, to raise our hands or our hearts to you. Because this is the day that we celebrate your parade, your time that you entered Jerusalem and, and looked towards the cross, the cross that set us all free. And Lord, we thank you for that gift. 
We thank you for your willingness to shed your blood so that we could be forgiven. And Father, we ask you again to forgive us for our sins. Forgive us for the times that we have fallen short. Forgive us for the days that we have felt sorry for ourselves and not spent time abiding in your presence. But Lord, as we confess those moments, let us hear that we are forgiven. Continue to draw us closer to you, to open our eyes and our ears to the wonderful ways that you are working in our lives, even in the midst of this pandemic. Because, Lord, no matter what this world throws at us, the Scripture reminds us that there is absolutely nothing that can separate us from your love shown to us in your Son, Jesus Christ. And that's what we are here to celebrate this day. A God who loves us in the middle of this moment and who lifts us up and sets us free. Lord, we pray for those who are sick and for those who are hurting. But also, Lord, we lift up to you all the doctors, the nurses, the, the first responders, the police officers, the firemen, all of those who have worked so tirelessly during, during this these weeks and and lord we pray a special blessing upon them this morning let them know that they are appreciated that we are thankful for them and that they are being lifted up as they try to minister to those who are affected by this awful virus we pray for the leaders of our country the leaders of our state, the leaders of our community, and the leaders of this church. Lord, we pray this and we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
wait a minute. Y'all aren't getting off the hook that easy. You are going to be children this morning, so here are your palm leaves. It's not going to hurt you to wave them as you go back to your seats. you got to understand, this is one of my top ten favorite Sundays of the year when we get to have the palm celebration. So uh, we're not going to miss that. Even with technical difficulties and, and everybody sitting at home not being a part and, and not being able to be here because of the coronavirus, we can still celebrate because guess what? God's still in control. And, and uh, I love this Sunday because of usually the children parade in and, and it's just something about the children, I guess, that excites me about this Sunday and but I have to say it's one of my top Sundays. It's not the top because next Sunday, I guess, would be that. And I broke my glasses. So this, this is one of those days. Uh, is it going to be there? <laughs> it's uh, Matthew 21, 1 through 11. Wait, I got them in place. So if I don't move too much. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethanage, Bethphage at the Mountain of Olives. Jesus sent two of them ahead, go into the village over there, and said, As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with a colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say, The Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Jerusalem, Look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he, said, he sat on it. Most of the crowd sped, spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the roads. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessed blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in, a, was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. And the crowds replied, It's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. You know, I love that story. And, and, and I know it, it was, uh, y'all thought, well, he's lost his mind making you wave palm leaves as you walk back in your seats. But I, I, I think we need a parade. I, I think the last three weeks have kind of weighed me down, and I need a time to celebrate. And, and I thought this week, you know, all we have done is had doom and gloom. Now is time for us to celebrate what's ahead because you know parades transform places uh you know you don't believe it show up down here on the for the homecoming parade or the christmas parade and watch what happens you know i'll never forget getting finally to walk out there one year and watch the homecoming parade and i walked around the corner and and, and i was amazed how excited the children were parents were almost having to to, to grab them and drag them physically out of the road because they were out in the road. And, and I know some of us, they were wanting the candy because the cheerleaders were bombarding people with candy from the tops of the fire trucks. But, but it was just the, the excitement and the joy of that moment. Now you've got to realize, Jesus knows what's ahead. We're six days from the cross yet Jesus in the middle of that moment joins in the parade and I think it transforms him but I think more importantly it transforms the disciples transforms the crowd transforms all of those there 
You know, I, I love that story because, because it begins to tell us and, and see that excitement, that, that joy, that expectation that is all through Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, I think Luke gives us a little hint of why the crowd joins in because he says in, in his telling that the multitude of disciples began to praise God. Matthew even tells us, I, I just read it to you, what did he say? It's turning this whole city upside down. You know, I wonder what caused such excitement. I mean, parades are not a new thing in Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, they have seen the Roman army parade through their streets many times in all of its glory. They've seen golden chariots, beautiful horses, soldiers dressed in their uniform. They, they've heard the music. They, they've watched King Herod as he's gone in and out with his lavish parades. So what was so exciting about this Jesus, this itinerant preacher and his motley crew? A crew of fishermen, tax collectors, and women of questionable backgrounds. You know, instead of golden horses and, and, and our chariots and, and fine horses, it's a humble little colt on which Jesus rides. Instead of a sword of steel, it's the sword of the Word of God that precedes Him. It's not fine linens and jewels, but it's the coats and the leaves from the trees that are laid before him. See, I think Luke gives us a hint in his words. Remember I told you, what did he say? He said the disciples began to praise God. Joyfully, with a loud voice, they praised God with all the deeds and, that they had seen. You know, I started thinking about that. Maybe that's what got the crowd in, her, in an uproar. Can you see it? Peter probably stood up and said, Hey, we saw him feed 5,000 one day with two fish and five loaves. And then maybe Matthew joins in. We've seen the lame walk and another jumps up. Then the blind see and lepers are cleansed. Demons even flee at the sound of his voice. Can you see it as those words are proclaimed through the city? All of a sudden, the dreams of the city come to life. They're dreams of the Messiah they have hoped for. They have prayed for the Messiah that would come to set them free from their oppression. They were built into almost a... It, it, it's going to be like us. The, the moment they say, hey, guess what? You're free again. You can go about your regular. You can go to church on Sunday. Everybody's going to be excited. It's, it's what they had dreamed for. They had hoped for. They had prayed for. No wonder the crowd sang out what I read you said, praise God. But, but in some it says, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hosanna, praise God, is the translation of Lord save us. So the crowd in this moment is crying out to Jesus, not as a prophet, but as the Messiah, as the King of kings, the one they had hoped for, prayed for, waited for the Messiah that would come and set things right. See, they just knew that at any moment, Jesus would turn and look up towards heaven and call down an army of angels, and Rome would flee, and they would be set free. Can you feel it? Can, can you imagine the excitement, Jesus coming? Can you almost hear those words, uh, Hosanna, praise God for the Son of David, blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. Save us, Lord, right here in our moment. But you know, it's always bothered me that the crowd, realistically, was trying to define Jesus. See, so they wanted the king that they expected. They wanted the king on their terms. 
Can anybody relate to Jesus in this story? I know that, that makes you uncomfortable that I said, can you relate to Jesus? But think about it. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where everyone wanted you to be something? Where everyone had certain expectations of you and you knew those expectations were not who you were? Or, or even worse, those expectations were not who God expected you to be. Okay, maybe you can't relate to Jesus. How, how about anybody ever been in the crowd? Things are falling down around you. The world seems turned upside down. Not only are you confined to your house, but now the internet has crashed. And, and Lord, I think the world is about to end. I think I saw that several times on Facebook last night. What are we going to do? And, and we, like the crowd, want to say, Jesus, come and save us. I, I've been faithful. I, I have followed your call. Come, Lord. Do what we expect you to do. See, we're drawn to the crowds. We're, we're drawn to the glamour. We're drawn to the lights. It, it's just like I talked about the, the, the parades that happen up and down Jackson Avenue. It, it changes. It transforms the whole street of the town. And you don't see it that way unless there's a parade. The crowd that day are transformed and, tra and cha changed because they have come to see a king, a savior, that will make things turn out the way they want them to. I imagine we all can relate in one way or the other to the crowd. Because I think we've all been guilty at one time or the other of putting our expectations, our wishes, our dreams on God. See, it's easy. As a matter of fact, I think it's almost natural for us to make ourselves the king instead of being in, instead of worshiping the king of kings see we all want that triumphant entry but we don't necessarily want to hear the rest of the story see matthew won't let us off the hook matthew's not like luke he doesn't give us an out matthew wants us to hear that story and I want you to go back and hear the words of Zechariah and of Isaiah that Matthew combines. Look, the king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Matthew makes no bones about it. The king is here, but it's not the king the people of Jerusalem have cried for, have prayed for, and expect. And Jesus will not be the king. No matter how much the crowd wants to mold him, no matter how much they want to make him into the king of kings, into the idea that they want, Jesus is not here to make a political statement. He's not here to gather fame for himself or for his disciples. He has come to offer us a new definition, definition of kingship. He has come to take things to a new level. Not a worldly level, but a heavenly level. Jesus has come to offer us freedom and power from the things of this world. To transform all those who dare to believe in Him instead of allowing people to conform Him into their definition of King. You know, I've often wondered, how did Jesus withstand it? How, how was Jesus able to keep from doing that? I mean, this is not the first time the crowds try to do it. If you remember in John's Gospel, when John tells the story of, of the feeding of 5,000, do you remember? They tried to take him by force and make him king, yet Jesus withdrew. See, I think Jesus was able to withstand and I think maybe we need to hear this in the middle of these times.
because Jesus always kept God at the center of his life. See, the more, most important thing for Jesus was not what the crowd thought. It was not what was going on around him. The most important thing for Jesus was his loving relationship with his heavenly Father. It goes back to what we talked about Thursday in our, in our practice Zoom devotion, you know, where Jesus says, I am the vine. It, it, and Jesus talks about his connection with God. That, and that's the most important thing because Jesus knows that without God, he is nothing. But, but with God, He is the King of kings. That connection is His number one goal. It, it is that connection that nourishes His soul, that nourishes His life. And because He nourishes His relationship with God, then He has the strength to go forth and the courage to listen to the vine grower his heavenly father instead of to the crowd. See, it's that loving relationship that allows him to move forward. It's that loving relationship that allows him to trust, to have faith, and to follow where God leads him. you got to know it's not a duty. It's about love. You know, I read a story a long time ago about a lady that her first husband had died, and several years later, she remarried. One day, she was in the house after she'd been married for a couple of years to her second husband, and she found a list in, in an old shoebox that her first husband had given her of things that she had to do every day. It's a list of make breakfast, clean the dishes, make the bed, do all these things. And she started looking down this list, and she said, you know, I used to hate him for that. But then as she looked at the list, she realized she did the exact same thing for her second husband. Every day. And it struck her. She said, you know, my first husband expected it, and I did these things out of duty. But now I do them not out of duty but out of love. See, if we're going to withstand the call of the world, it, we must follow Jesus' example here and place our faith, our trust, our hope, not in the world, not in the government, not in the state, but our hope is in Jesus Christ and nothing less. He is the one that is there to help us go forward. And He is the one who will nourish us, strengthen us, and show us what it means to have a loving relationship with our Heavenly Father, not because it's forced, but because we are called out of love into that moment. Henry Blackaby actually tells a story in his workbook, Experiencing God. He says there was one of his church members who, who always seemed to have difficulties. He, he had difficulties in his personal life. He had difficulties in his family, at work, and in the church. Henry said, finally, one day I made an appointment with him and went and sat down with him. And he said, I asked him this one question. He said, can you describe your relationship with God by sincerely saying, I love God with all of my heart. He said, when he asked that man that, he got the strangest look. The man looked at him and said, well, you know, nobody's ever asked me that. But he said, the truth of it is, I can't describe my relationship with God that way. Oh, I, I could say that I obey him, I, I serve him, I, I worship him, I fear him, but I can't say I love him with all my heart. See, Jesus would stand before us and tell us beyond a shadow of a doubt that he loved his heavenly Father with every ounce of his being. 
But I think he would also look at us and say, do you love my father that way? Do you love me with every ounce of your being? If you don't, allow the Holy Spirit to transform you. If you don't, grab hold of that vine and allow me to nourish you and to make you into the person that God would have you to be. But I love this story, and I, I think I've been hammering this for the last three weeks, and it really bugged me because it's not just that loving relationship. Jesus comes into Jerusalem, and, and I think what draws the crowd is Jesus is available. He, he, he's right there in the middle of it. See, the other parades they have seen in the past, there, there is a, 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 a king or a, a leader or a soldier or somebody that is there, but surrounding him is these hordes of soldiers who, who protect them from the crowd. But when Jesus entered into the city that day, he came in on their level. He, he allowed them to touch him. He was willing to touch them. I've shared this story before, and it's probably my favorite Christmas story, and I know this is not Christmas. But Chris and I keep the little uh, manger scene that I bought in the Holy Lands up all year round, and every time I see it, I'll get up and start fooling with it and putting it in order. I just have trouble because I remember the story about a little five-year-old girl who put up the manger scene. Do you remember me telling you that? that her dad was just bugged by it because she put the manger scene, the baby Jesus, Mary and Joseph, every character right there around Jesus. Just so close, it was, they were all jumbled together. The dad saw it and he went and laid everything. You know how we do it, where there's Jesus and there's Mary and there's Joseph and there's the sheep and the wise men and everybody's kind of surrounded around but at a distance. Well, the dad moved the manger scene back the way he thought it should be. He left the room, and his five-year-old little girl came in, and she got over there and saw it, and she was just, she said, oh, I can't believe this. So she went over and bunched them all back together. When her dad called her, he said, what are you doing? She said, I'm just doing it because everybody that was there would want to be close to baby Jesus because they'd want to touch him. See, Jesus came to be available. He showed up at that couple's wedding in Canaan and he turned water into wine. He heard the cries of a blind man and what does he do? He walks over and he heals him. He, he hears the leper come around the corner with his bell on his, on his neck and screaming, leper, 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 and nobody's touched him in years. And Jesus is moved with compassion, and he walks over to him and lays his hands upon him. He sees the crowd coming out to him like sheep without a shepherd, and he is moved with compassion. Jesus feels the pain of Jairus. When he tells him his daughter is sick and at the point of death and Jesus goes in the middle of that moment and offers hope, Jesus feels the woman hemorrhaging, touching his garment. He knows she's healed. He knows that physically she is well and yet he stops and he turns and he looks her in the eye and he heals her spiritually as well. Jesus enters the temple. God's house of prayer. And he's moved to the point of anger when those who are given responsibility to take care of the temple have turned it into a den of thieves. Jesus is the bridge that has come. The bridge that has come to lay across the gap that was formed in the Garden of Eden. He is there to be available to show us how much God loves us. 
And Jesus knew it. That was what he was Thursday night. You'll read this if you do your devotions on Thursday. The disciples are in the upper room. I mean, Jesus knew it was his last meal. I mean, he could have gone and called all the heads of state together and celebrated and said at the, the head of the table. But Jesus chose those 12, his friends, and he gathered in a room with them alone. As they're having a meal together, there's an argument that breaks out about who is the greatest or what greatness really means. Jesus never says a word, but he gets up, he goes to the corner, wraps a towel around his waist, picks up a basin, fills it with water, comes to his disciples, gets down on his knees and washes their feet one by one. Jesus shows them what true greatness is. He shows them what the cross means for you, for me, and for them. There's a story that's told by Donald Barnhouse Supposedly it's true, but I don't know. But it was when Chief Justice Charles Evan Hughes moved to Washington, D.C. to take his place as Chief Justice. He began to look around D.C. and he finally found a Baptist church in the area. You know, his father was a Baptist minister, so it was just, he, he had to be involved in, in a local Baptist church. And he went that day and, and he started visiting and he found out that it was his home so he went to the pastor and said you know i'd like to join and the pastor said well great on palm sunday we're celebrating all, uh, all the people that are wanting to join are going to be recognized that day palm sunday came at the end of the service the pastor started calling everyone forward that was joining one by one the first one he called was a man named asin asin was new to washington area as well he had left the West Coast and moved to D.C. to work and open his own laundry mat there. When Asin came down the middle of the aisle, he walked up, the pastor shook his hand, and Asin went to the right side of the church to stand. The pastor called the next family. They came down the middle aisle. They shook the pastor's hand. They went to the left side of the church. He called the next family. They came down the middle aisle. They shook the pastor's hand. They went to the left side of the church. He called the next family. They came down the middle aisle. He shook their hand. They went to the left side of the church. Finally, he called Chief Justice Hughes. Chief Justice Hughes walked down the middle of the aisle, shook the pastor's hand, and he stopped and walked to the right-hand side of the church and stood right beside Ossine. Because Chief Justice Hughes knew that he could not let this humble Chinese laundryman be taken, be shamed in this moment. When the pastor finished, he stopped and he looked at his congregation. He said, I don't want you to miss this moment. I don't want you to see the power of the cross here in this moment because what you've got to see is that at the cross, the ground is level. Barnhart said, Mr. Hughes be behaved like a true Christian. He took his place beside a laundryman, and, and by his act, he prevent, prevented embarrassment to a humble Chinese. He showed, too, the love of Christ. who has the gift of standing by. Why did God do it? God sent Jesus for you and me. For all of us. He wanted us to know that there was more to this world than fame, than fortune, than comfort. He wanted us to know that life, real life, was about a loving relationship with our Heavenly Father. 
and that he wanted us to know that his son Jesus was standing right here beside us in the middle of our discomfort making the ground level so that you and I could be whole so this morning I ask you simply in the middle of this time do you love Jesus with all your heart and yes you're alone in your home while you're with your families some of you are alone some of you don't have anybody I want you to remember that Jesus is standing beside you holding your hand ready for that moment amen If you're at home this morning, which <laughs> I know, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> I lost my brain for a minute. This morning, whether you're home or whether you're the few of us that are here, I remind you that this is the time where you can stop and pray. Maybe you are not loving Jesus with all your heart. Well, ask him. And He'll send you the Holy Spirit to help you do that. Or maybe you just need to stop and pray. Because maybe you have allowed the world to pull you away from Jesus. As we sing together. There is one thing I forgot. Miss Ponda at 8 o'clock every night, what Monday through Thursday this week, will be doing her, her family devotion. I probably didn't need to remind you because all of you have enjoyed that this last week. But please remember to tune in for that as well. 
this week as we uh, move forward towards Easter. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.